Lewis's during the summer, there's usually quite a settlement of campers. In a pretty grove of alders and oaks between the mountains and the San Anna River is a cluster of picturesque cabins. One is sure of a good supper, an entertaining host, and a bed where he's alone to sleep with the sound of the mountain torrent dashing over the stones. The location is so perfect, and the surrounding conditions are in every way so agreeable that many travelers in these mountains care to go no farther and tarry here like lotus eaters. However, the more intrepid travelers kept going. They were intent on seeing the wonders of Bear Valley, including the world's largest man made lake. At that time, in the 1890s, the Bear Lake was the largest man made lake in the world. And so it was considered to be kind of a wonder at the time, and that was one of the reasons why people wanted to go and visit it. And they had to go over a summit before reaching Bear Valley, and so this is the summit that you're coming over. We're riding on our burrows over the mountain, and then you get to the top and you see this view. Believe it or not, this was the road going down into Bear Valley <laughs> on the back of a burrow or a horse. So, again, if somebody sees a road there, let me know. That's where it was. Finally, they reached Fair Valley and the lake. And that's a nice little resort down here. A traveler in the 1800s remarked, two young men, Knight and Metcalf by name, have a very comfortable hotel in the valley, about half a mile from the lake. It is in the midst of a fine grove of great pines on the ground or slopes down to the water. The scenery is ideal at the first sunset one feels himself quite repaid for all of the toil which he has allowed his burrow to execute for him. Both at Lewis's and at night at Metcalf's, the charge is ten dollars a week, and the rate for a short space of time is calculated on the same basis. The accommodations are crude but comfortable, and the fare is plain but appetizing. Staying in the valley, tourists could gaze in awe at the Bear Valley Dam with the old masonry dam, which was said to hold back 10 billion gallons of water. It was noted that the horses, horses for traveling about in the mountains can generally be had at from 50 cents to one dollar a day. When the hotel people have horses, they're, they're not amused. They're disposed to be very liberal with them. The more adventuresome, a two-day trip to Mount San Antonio, known as Old Grayback, was on offer with a guy like this fellow, his man's name is Mr. Vincent, and he specialized in trips to the summit of the tallest mountain in the range. And of course, fishing was the most popular pastime among guests, especially the gentlemen. When all of the most pleasant pastimes had been exhausted, it was time to do the whole trip over again, in reverse. <laughs> on the trusty snowy donkeys. So you know people were probably extending their vacations a lot, saying, yeah, got, I don't know, donkeys and not bully. <laughs> then at the turn of the 20th century, the, this is the farm San Bernardino Board of Supervisors, and they are supervising the opening or the beginning of our first road into the mountains in 1914 which went up the same trail, Mount Helm Canyon, and up to Angeles Oaks and to Seven Oaks and over the summit and into Bear Valley. But they were doing now, the idea was that they were doing automobiles, which had their own problems <laughs> besides yeah. the donkeys. Now the people of Highland wanted the road to go through Highland and up the Santa Ana River Canyon and then go up to Clark's uh, River and over the summit and into Bear Valley. Um, but so did the people of Redlands because all that tourist traffic meant dollars. And so Highland and Redlands were in a big fist of trying to get who's going to get the, the road into the mountains? Who's going to get all that traffic? Well, one night at the Elks Club, all the millionaires in Redlands sat around and said, by golly, we have to do something about this. I know, if we have to, we'll build it ourselves. <laughs> sure. Well, this is the Millionaires of 
gremlins, um, <laughs> with their shirt sleeves rolled up, pretending to go to the road in Milton County because it was absolutely a publicity stunt. And there is a film of this day uh, that was made, shot by Pathé, and it exists to this day and is in Paris, and I'm trying to get a copy of that one because that would be quite fun to see that this wonderful film about pretending to go to the road in in vain. But there's not got enough attention from board of supervisors that the road went from Redlands through Milford Canyon and their home canyon. And as soon as automobiles started going up, car camping became the thing. So there were some car campers on the Lake. This was the road. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I'd rather be on a donkey. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it was pretty narrow, and it was twisty, and it was crumbly, and they built it very quickly with prison labor. Um, so I don't know. <laughs> and because it was so narrow, they had to come up with this scheme, this very uncomplicated scheme for going up or coming down. You can only go up or you could come down because there was no two-way traffic. And so if you arrived in Milford Canyon and you wanted to go up to Bear Valley, uh, you might have to camp for a day or two there to wait for the traffic to come down and then to be allowed for, to go up. And the opposite was true in Bear Valley. So only one way up or one way down. Uh, and also King Harvey, it was a boon to her because the toll gate for the road to the mountains ended up being right on her property. And Kate, at this point, had married again after her brother shot her brother-in-law and she divorced that husband and then she married another one when she was in her 40s and everybody was quite surprised that Kate, who was not a particularly attractive lady, um, has, was having this romantic interlude with this guy, and she ended up marrying him. He was right at the beginning of World War I, and he went off to go serve. So I think she married him because he was going off to go serve, <laughs> <laughs> or he, her. And uh, her, hus her husband came back, and her brother shot him. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then her brother left and went off to the wilderness for a few years and lived on his own. But um, so Kate was a little bit hard bitten by this point when people were stopping with their cars at the toll gate on her property. And she wore loaded six guns on her ample hips and threatened to shoot people if they got out of line. So that was how she got the name Cactus Kate, because she was quickly there at the toll booth going up the mountain. And it wasn't until August 12, 1960, the Highway 38, <coughs> the road we now know as the back way to there, actually opened and ushered in the new era of mountain travel. So no more boroughs and no more funny little cars that go up and down the road. We have the big road. If anyone has questions, we have time, I'd be happy to answer them. That's the journey to do there. I'll come up front. I have a question. Why did they go up the creek and not get Santa Ana Canyon? They go up and down and up again. Yes, I know, because they ultimately ended up in Santa Ana Canyon during the Santa Ana River Valley. Um, it was purely because of the pressure from the business people of Redlands that it actually came up through the Milford Canyon and went over and became a, a harder road, really. But I have some photographs of, I recently done a few stories about through our massive floods, and really the road would not have survived going out of the San Canyon because the water would come down there and the flood had been just. So it survived longer going up the creek and up the mountain canyon. I hiked from the flood and up to Angel Yes. I love that road. Mm -hmm. And you, you used to be able to drive across it. Now, in the mm -hmm. 70s, they, blocked it, they lost that bridge right there. Mm -hmm. Is that the 70s 
seeing. That's the same road. road. Mm -hmm. That is the road that we're talking about here. Initially, before that road was cut in, because it was cut in and they were traveling it on horses and burros and mules, even with that. But before that, they just rode basically along the creek um, in the 1880s and early 1890s. Before that road was kind of started to be cut in, they were just basically riding up the creek, which was really hard because it got quite narrow and was very rocky in a lot of places. Yes. I just wanted to say when I first started working for the Forest Service, that was open. As you said, and they said, yeah, and my start later than that, but it was open and you could drive it <coughs> fairly easily unless there was a rock slide. Mm -hmm. But then when I started there, it was closed suddenly because some bell would lit the bridge on fire. <laughs> the one bridge you had to cross. So then it oh. stayed in two pieces from up and down, you know. And uh, actually, I could go in there and the uh, telephone line ran through there in Edison, so they kind of like to keep it open so they get access to holes. So that's how it kind of ended. Actually, Dudley Glass, one of the interesting yeah. things, Dudley Glass decided that he wanted <laughs> the competition for the little resorts were, was really, really fierce in our mountains early on, especially, you know, sort of coming into the, as the Depression came on and everything, people were trying to get people to come up there. Dudley Glass decided he was going to have a telephone and that would be his big draw because he was going to have a telephone. So they, Dudley and a bunch of guys, um, got the Pacific telephone and they got the cabling for it and they walked and rode on horses up the canyon and they strung the wire through trees all the way up Mount Home Canyon to Seven Oaks to put his phone line in. And it was that way into the 70s. It was just lines strung through trees <laughs> all the way up. But he had the first phone in the mountains. And, and the phones up there, I know, um, like the one on the wall right there, pointing at Tom, right there, mm -hmm. the ball farm, those were still in there when I was driving the school bus from Forest Falls to Redwoods High School. Mm -hmm. They were still in Seven Oaks and some Angeles Oaks. And finally, my train worked for the food company said, well, I have to go pick them all out. And they finally got a real, a real big black telephone. It was very loud. Yeah, I had And we had in the uh, in Milton Canyon, the, when they finally got a fire system sort of in the late 40s, early 50s, and we had the way that the volunteers were notified of uh, problems that we had telephones on the little um, stands that were in a tree somewhere. And you had to, there's a fire, you had to run up to the tree and grab a red phone. Yeah. And if you were short, it was really difficult because it was up a tree. And get the phone and it would dial into Forest Home switchboard and you would call in the fire service for you. So you didn't want to have a fire. <laughs> yeah, no, I was at the uh, Angeles Oaks Ranger Station and, and Steve was there before me. Um, I got the a, a hassle of pictures and paperwork from the man who was there. His father was there in 32. And so you had the Forest Service Catechism, which was a little book that had everything in the world you would have to know about the Forest Service, and that went in your saddlebag. And you also had a length of rope and some spikes you could put on your boots, and you had a horse, and he had a horse, and you had to climb up the poles so and you could flip in and talk to the boss if you need to. <laughs> or if they the it, you had to climb up and fix it. Yep. And I said, I love my job and I'm very rough and tumble, but I'm glad I don't have to ride a horse. Janet, <laughs> how long did it take you to get on a horse from uh, Redlands to the Bear Valley? It was on average, if they were really going where they didn't stay overnight too many places and all that, but they kind of arrived in the morning and they kept going. It was about six days to get up to Bear Valley. So like this, I mean, the one lady described, you know, they've been riding for quite a while, and it's four and a half months. Stopping. <laughs> and they have to have a rest, you know, and they have to have something to eat, and then have a nap under a tree, and then they get back on the burrow, and then they go over another five miles, and then they stop again. And, uh, yeah. Shannon, thanks for your presentation. Oh, well, thank uh, you for coming. Two-part question. Mm -hmm. First part is uh, free vehicles on those resorts. I didn't notice a lot of pictures with snow in the background. So um, these resorts essentially just closed down during 
Can everybody hear the question? He wanted to yeah. know if the resorts basically closed down during the winter. Yes, they all closed down. And people who sort of ran the resorts had dual lives, like Matthew Lewis, where he had his sheep. And as soon as it started to get cold, he'd take the sheep down to the valley. And they would stay in the valley, pretty much like the indigenous people did, mm -hmm. interestingly enough. And they would just like sort of stay in a hotel in San Bernardino or stay with friends or something. And they'd stay out of the mountains for until it thawed, basically. Now, did they have uh, something lined up for vehicles or horses uh, where people went out and they got stuck in weather or for other reasons to get back up there and rescue them? Or was it just a kind of hurry up and wait? It was a hurry up and wait kind of a situation. Matthew Lewis ended up with a lot of people in Seven Oaks because um, actually, right after the advent of automobiles, car racing, auto racing became <coughs> just a huge, huge thing. And um, at the end of Mill Creek Canyon, there was an, actually a community with a thousand people that not that many people know about called Burris. And it was um, built by a man who, his two sons were up in Mill Creek Canyon and they were prospecting for gold. And I'll just put it to rest right now. A dollar ninety-two was the most that anybody actually made in gold in Mill Creek Canyon. <laughs> Got it documented. There was no gold in Mill Creek Canyon, but they were looking for it. And they were up at the very end of the canyon, and they found something that actually ended up being much more important. A mile long, mile high wall of pure white marble. Yeah. Your story. Your story. Yeah, it's just about a mile west of the jump off at the very end of Mill Creek Canyon. And so he <laughs> hightailed it down, put a claim on the land, and the mineral claim on the land, and then brought crews in, and they had they started building infrastructure, and there was a town there, and there was a company store, there were multiple cabins, um, and there were about a thousand workers there at the height of the thing. And they were milling pure white marble pillars up 25 to 30 feet in length in one piece of marble. Mm -hmm. this, because of the length of this thing, they could you know, do these monstrous <coughs> pillars that courthouses and you know, great mansions and things loved out of one piece of marble. And they were carting it out of Mill Creek Canyon with box carts. It was still very primitive. This was 1907 when he found this wall of marble. And they were carting it out in box carts and then taking it all the way into Los Angeles, and they had a mill at San Pedro, and they had their own spur line on the Santa Fe Railroad. And they were shipping out. So many of the mansions on Knob Hill in San Francisco, um, some of the federal building in Los Angeles, all were made with marble from this little big quarry in Burris. And <laughs> then after they got through the fight layer, there was pink, there was green, there was blue. There was blue veined with amber. There was black. There were all these different colors of marble. And it was compared to actually to Carrera, I believe. It was one of the best, the greatest finds of marble in the United States. And as they got through that, it became very porous and started to break apart. And so the quarry ended, basically. It was uh, reactivated in the, in the 40s during World War II because limestone was used in armaments. And so they were pouring limestone out there. And they actually followed all of the documentation through the US government. And some of the limestone from the Mill Creek Quarry was used in bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So that was part of our not very good heritage <laughs> in Mill Creek Canyon. But yes, so. You know, I was a teenager up there one day when we had nothing to do. We all decided we were going to hike and go see the quarry. Mm -hmm. We got up there, and of course, a lot of bushes and stuff. And I don't really remember if they had dynamited it just before that or after we went, because we got in all kinds of trouble with the, all the dads who were all on search and rescue at the end of the Who to go up there? And they did dynamite it because people were trying to get in and see what they find. Yeah. There's, if, if you hike up there, it's a, it's a beautiful hike. It's a hard hike, but it's yeah. a beautiful hike. There are still, uh, they had a little funicular uh, short inclined railroad actually mm -hmm. up there because they were cutting these massive slabs of marble and then putting them onto this lift that would take them down this little railroad 
and then they would lug them on the carts and take them out. You can still see there are pieces of the rail line, and there's the foundation of the store up there. And I can't even remember why I was talking about cars in the first place. We were talking about gold. Racing. Oh, yeah. racing. Yes. Oh, yes. So, automo back to the real subject, automobile racing, the Burris family, the two young sons, this is 1907 and around 1910, 1912 automobiles happened. And they were making tremendous amounts of money with the marble. So the boys went nuts for automobiles. And they had a road race called the Burris Cup Race. And they raced from the Casa Lilla Hotel all the way up to the quarry mm -hmm. in these very primitive early automobiles. And it took 10 sets of tires to get from Redlands to the top of the quarry. Wow. And it was there was no road because they just, you know, <laughs> there's all these rocks and boulders, and there's photographs of one that wrecked and it's like one foot up on a boulder, and it was crazy. And they if they didn't have it at a specific time, it was whoever wanted to challenge then did the race. So it was ongoing like all the time because somebody wanted to break the record, and the record I think ultimate best record was 51 minutes from Redlands to the quarry with 10 sets of tires and 14 gates that they had to stop in and 13 crossings of the creek. So that was a pretty good time and a pretty primitive car. But there was also a road race a similar period of time that was going, they were trying to road race to Bear Valley and they did it in March. And there was a huge storm. <laughs> And so these cars were just packed in snow and they had to walk out once they got kind of past Angeles Oaks and they were between Angeles Oaks and Santa Ana River Valley. They were trying to get down the side of the hill and there's this massive snow and they're sliding all over the place and then they're covered in snow and it kind of avalanched on them. And so they had to walk and they managed to make it to Matthew Lewis's at Seven Oaks and he was there at the time, fortunately. And he knew how to feed them because <laughs> they would not have been able to figure that out for themselves. But they were there with him until past July. Wow. Yeah, they were stuck with him in seven months until past July. Yes, I just want to make mention the uh, three phase generator that was down, to, down to, I think it's still there, in mm -hmm. uh, Mill Creek number one powerhouse. There's a photo of it down yeah, this next aisle over here. Oh, good. Is Thurman's Flats where you go for picnic now? Is mm -hmm. that where Thurman's Ranch was? That's where Thurman's Ranch was. Oh. Yes. Um, initially, it was Thurman's Ranch. He died in about, I'm trying to remember when he actually died, it's in the book, but um, early in the 1900s. And um, the first Mill Creek Ranger Station was built on the Thurman property, on the Thurman Ranch property. So there were still some of Thurman's bird ranch buildings and home and things that were there, and there was the ranger station. And then in 1938, when we had the catastrophic flood in 1938, it really undermined and almost took out the, the first military ranger station, which was there for the flood, and they moved it further down to where it is now. But yes, that was named after slaves that were in that system. There, there is one residence, I lived in for about a year, from the original you know, Thurman Flats, which is now still, it's over at the new uh, Mill Creek Ranger Station. They moved it? Huh? Did they move it? Yeah, they moved oh, it. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. yeah, they did. I looked at it for about a year. Yeah. And was the ghost of Sylvanus yes. in it? Yes, it was. Yeah. He, was. he was, well, he was a character. He was. They said he was the master of the in intricate diamond hitch. And he could put a diamond hitch on a donkey. He could tie that glass case on it, and it wouldn't fall off. The guy was a wizard as far as the diamond hitch. He also had a, he, well, later in, on in his life, when he had the ranch there in Mill Creek Canyon, he, this is a weird, interesting little fact, he got into uh, Angora goats. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He had a, uh, 200 Angora goats. And the reason that he had the Angora goats was that he was he was hired by the Forest Service to have the goats chew fire trails. Yep. So he would, he would take all the goats out in the morning, and they were all these pets, and they would follow them around, and he would stake 
the goats on a, you take them up like you pack on a ranch, you would stake the goats and they would just eat everything that there was in them and then you would take them a little higher up, stake them until they had eaten up half. And then he sold their wool and he really got quite a bit of money for it. I think he was getting $20 a pound or something like that in those early days because they, were, they used the Angora goat wool for the rag tops of automobiles. Mm -hmm. That's not why they made. That was what the tops of automobiles were made out of was Angora goat wool. And so he made a killing in that. I read that they were worried about all the trout that were being caught and hauled away, and so they set a limit of 50 a day. <laughs> yes, and it, it was crazy. I mean, we had a lot of little photos where they just had people would go fishing, and then there would be piles, like piles of trout, like this, where they would just throw them in piles because they were just taking them for sport. Um, yeah. Okay. Now it's now it's all. Very Because the stuff that they take out of helicopters to uh, take it, you know, to kill a fire, yeah. and that goes down the river, and that just goes across. Yeah. So there's coming. Not anymore. Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. What? Well, the deals with that product. They made it so it's, oh, it does. It's fish friendly. The if it's, yeah. If it's heavy duty and in one plate of gas, but you can drink it, and we we bought fire in it for. Ever, but I know back then it was it was boring. And you remember the old boring bombers? Okay, and they always said, "Oh, there's the boring bombers." People still say that. Boring's been out for a long time. Boring was a terrible uh, product. Put the fire out, but it also scalded the earth, killed the animals. And when it scalded the earth, nothing would grow back. Well, you have to have it grow back to hold the dirt. Well, that's why we went to dimonium phosphate, and that's the whole story on that. So, yeah, it wasn't a nice product. Kind of like, kind of like kind of like uh, some other products we've used. DDT. One of my favorite things in the, in the 20s, they did a, a, there was another publicity stuff that had all these flappers in their little outfits with their Mary Jane shoes and their fluffy dresses <laughs> and fishing poles. Oh my. And they put them out in Mill Creek Canyon and fishing. And did a film about all the flowers. Oh my Fishing in Milk Creek Canyon was so easy, even a woman could do it. Oh, yeah. High heels. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, Shannon. That Thank was awesome. you so much.